Good morning, good morning. Uh, my name is Horacio Kaufman. I'm a doctor and a professor of neurology at NYU. First, I want to thank uh, Defeat MSA for organizing this symposium and inviting me to, to talk to you. You see, uh, all my professional life, I was dedicated to take care of patients with MSA like you. You see, in that way, uh, or because of that, I'm very well acquainted with the difficulties and, and tribulations that um, patients with MSA go through. As you are well aware, in addition to, to problems with movement, uh, people with MSA also have trouble with the function of the internal organs. Uh, the cardiovascular system, the gastroenterology problems, I mean the gut, uh, as well as the, the bladder, and many times the lungs and um, the ability to swallow. Now, what I want to give you today, what I want to talk today is, um, I want to give you a message of hope. I want to tell you that the path is set and that progress uh, significant progress is being made uh, to treat multiple system atrophy. You see, I, I started uh, taking care of patients with MSA in the 1980s. At that time, MSA went mostly unrecognized. It was just one of a mixed group of diseases called atypical Parkinsonism. Now, a lot has changed since then. The, the clinical recognition of MSA has improved significantly, and most importantly has been the discovery that a protein that is normally produced in the brain called alpha-synuclein actually misfolds, it, it um, pleats abnormally accumulates and that accumulation, that abnormal accumulation is the reason for the neuronal loss. Now, this understanding of multiple system atrophy has now led to studies and clinical trials that are especially designed for people with MSA. And it's very important for you to participate so what I want to do today in, in, the last, uh, in the next several minutes is to tell you about these uh, trials and why it is so important for you to participate. You see, my, my message is, is very simple and straightforward. Without clinical trials, there will be no new drugs. So by participating in studies, you can make drugs available for you and others with the same disease. So your participation is the, what makes uh, progress possible. Without that, it would be impossible. So I want to remind you today or, or tell you that there are a number of steps needed to get a drug uh, in a clinical trial. You know, first, there are a number of preclinical studies in animals, uh, toxicology, and also the ability of the drug to, to produce changes in animal models. After that process that can take several years, drugs uh, can be approved for testing in humans, not for use, just for testing. So that requires a number of steps. The first is what's called a phase one study, and that has only a few participants. Based on those results, it goes to what's called a phase two study that has a higher number of participants, 40, 60, or more. And then if that is positive, then it goes to what's called phase three, in which there is a significant number of participants, at least 100 or 300 in the case of rare diseases like MSA, and then based on those results, the, all the data is submitted for the FDA for approval. So the FDA reviews that, and if it confirms the safety and effectiveness of the drug, the drug is approved, the doctors can prescribe it, and insurance, of course, will cover that. 
So how do we do that? Well, there are actually two types of studies that you should be aware of and I want to describe them. One is the observational studies. In these observational studies, you do not receive a drug uh, or not a new drug. We track clinical and other information while you receive the best available medical care. Now, these observational studies are very important. We come back to that in a minute. Then you have interventional studies. In the interventional studies, you do receive a drug. Now, it's important for you to know, as I mentioned, that in an observational study, you take all available drugs that are approved. Now, in the interventional study, you take only one new experimental drug, and you cannot change the other ones that you're taking. Now, interventional studies are of two types themselves. One is disease-modifying studies. These disease-modifying studies are, um, they, they test drugs that were designed to uh, potentially slow down or arrest the progression of the disease. They target the root cause of the disease. It's important to know that you may not immediately uh, feel better. In fact, these drugs could have side effects like, uh, let's say, chemotherapy for severe diseases or cancer. They themselves will not make you feel good, but they, um, they um, uh, target the root cause and potentially will stop or arrest the progression of the disease. And the second type of interventional studies are the symptomatic drugs. The symptomatic drugs are designed to make you feel better. They target specific symptoms. They may not cure the disease or slow its progression, that, but they um, treat the complications. And again, uh, the idea is to make you feel better. Now, I want to tell you about both um, observational and interventional studies that are available now uh, at NYU for patients with MSA. There is one observational study that I'll tell you in a minute, and there are also interventional studies both for symptomatic and disease-modifying drugs. So, the observational study that I want to tell you about that just started is called TRAC MSA. Now, as you, as you may be aware, or if not, I want to, to tell you, uh, there are a number of disease-modifying treatments in the pipeline for MSA. They are described here, and it also shows the phase, uh, phase one, two, or three, um, of their, the stage of their clinical trial. Now, uh, this MPO, in, MPO inhibitor, uh, Berdiperstat, uh, from Biohaven, the enrollment has finished. There is one uh, available that is called Sirolimus. Now, to do this study, these trials, for these trials to be successful, we need to know how fast or slow certain aspects that we call endpoints of the disease progress. In order to test this drug, we need to know these things. So we need to use these endpoints, these specific symptoms or, or um, impairments in future clinical trials to determine if a new drug is helpful in slowing MSA. So to do this, we need the observational studies before doing the interventional. Why? Because you, we need to follow you very closely to see and measure how you are. So track MSA will follow very closely and carefully 50 patients with MSA for a year. Patients will, will have to answer questionnaires, will have brain MRIs with no contrast, we we'll have blood samples taken for measurements of a number of biomarkers. Uh, they will also have CSF samples and uh, motor assessments with standardized scales. They will also have video and certain monitors that measure their ability to move. Now, this will be done at least three times from the first visit, then six months and one year. So. 
where will this study occur? Where, where is it occurring? It's in two sites. One is at NYU in New York, the other is in Innsbruck in Austria. So patients in Europe and the US could uh, be enrolled and participate. Now, uh, as I told you, it involves at least three visits. Now, do you have to pay to be enrolled? No, of course not, not at all. And uh, Track MSA, this study is funded in part by uh, Biogen, a pharmaceutical company. You will even be reimbursed for travel and time. And what I want to tell you also is that there is a possible benefit uh, for you, although this is an observational study, and it's because patients that are in the track MSA will have priority to enroll in the phase two um, study that Biogen is sponsored with a new compound uh, called B2B1010 and uh, currently is in phase one in Europe and will occur in the uh, US. Here you see um, announced this um, um, potential agent in the, in the pipeline and uh, again, Track MSA will give you a direct first priority when this start start when this trial starts. Of course, you don't have to participate. It will give you that uh, priority. If you are interested in participating in Track MSA, this is the email and the phone number, and it will be available in the Defeat MSA website. Uh, to the study coordinator that you can call and arrange uh, for, for more information and for a, for a visit. Now, what about interventional trials? Interventional with disease-modifying drugs. As I tell you, there are a number of potential disease-modifying uh, drugs in the pipeline. Now, the only one that is available right now is Sirolimus. Uh, That's a phase two study. Sirolimus, so rapamycin, is an mTOR inhibitor. Now, this study is happening at uh, NYU, is sponsored by NIH, is not sponsored by a pharmaceutical company. You see, Sirolimus is a drug that has been uh, approved by the FDA for uh, almost 20 years, and um, it's approved for transplant, organ transplant rejection. Now, in addition to organ, plant, uh, to organ transplant rejection, Sirolimus is also a potent activator of autophagy. Autophagy is the process by which the organism, the cells, eliminates the proteins that are excessively accumulated. As I mentioned to you, and, and you, you heard from the previous speakers, MSA is caused by excessive accumulation of this protein. So by stimulating autophagy, we hope that Sirolimus would be able to slow the progression of the disease. There are uh, still five available slots for, for patients. And again, if you are interested in this study, uh, this is Jose Martinez is the coordinator and you can call and get more information. Now, I want to, to use the, the last part of my talk to tell you about symptomatic trials for MSAs, particularly or specifically for one trial that is for neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. Remember, symptomatic trials, as we mentioned, are, are, are designed to make you feel better. You are the one that decides if the drug works or not by what you tell us when you are receiving it. Now, what is neurogenic orthostatic hypotension? What is it? Well, as the name tells you, hypotension is an abnormally low blood pressure Orthostatic means related to standing or the upright posture, and neurogenic means that is the result of problems arising in the nervous system. So neurogenic orthostatic hypotension is a fall in blood pressure on standing, causing low blood pressure in the upright position, and has a neurological cause. Now, the autonomic nervous system, and 
you heard this, this word, is a, because it's affected in MSA, is a network of nerves that innervate all the organs and they control the involuntary actions of the body, anything that doesn't require your consciousness, like breathing, blood pressure and heart rate, sweating, sexual function, bladder function. Now, in MSA, as I um, emphasized to you before, or a few times in the talk, the nerves in the brain and the spinal cord that control the organs, the autonomic nerves, are affected and they die. So, the cause, this, this um, impairment of autonomic nerves, of cables that go to the blood vessels, causes problem, problems with blood pressure and heart rate control. Now, how do we diagnose NOH? It's very simple. The pressure has to be measured when, and the heart rate when you are supine. And then again, uh, when you are standing or upright. Now, in orthostatic hypotension or neurogenic orthostatic hypotension, there is a sustained fall in uh, blood pressure of at least 20 millimeters of mercury systolic, the higher number, and 10 millimeters of diastolic, the, the lower number, within three minutes of being upright. Now, why is this important? Well, this, this little graph uh, is a real recording. This is the blood pressure that you see here, and this is time, right? Here are the numbers. This is the blood pressure when a patient with MSA is supine, right? And this is what happens when he stands up. As you can see, there's a quick, dramatic fall in blood pressure, and after around two minutes, the pressure is as low as 68 over 55, the patient feels lightheaded and needs to sit down when the pressure again goes back up. Now, the graph here shows what happened with the blood supply in the brain. When you are flat, you see the number is 55. This is the, the waves of blood in the brain. This is measured directly with a Doppler probe put here that measures the amount of blood that goes to the brain. You see what happens here upon standing up, there's a dramatic fall. And because of that fall in blood supply to the brain is that you feel symptoms and the blood supply to the brain goes again back up, not to normal, but enough to, um, in, to, to reduce symptoms when you sit down. Now, this graph shows the blood pressures that you need. The, uh, this is the arterial and this is the venous pressure that you need at the level of the heart to maintain blood supply to the brain. As you can see, when, if the pressure is lower, um, not enough blood goes to the brain and patients experience lightheadedness or dizziness. Uh, if the pressure is even lower, they also feel visual changes. They can, uh, in addition to, to that, feel pain in the, in the shoulders and in the neck that we call cold hunger pain, and then a sensation of fatigue or weakness. And uh, if the fall in blood pressure is, is severe enough, even loss of consciousness. So these symptoms, what in, what's important is that they only occur when the patient stand, when the patient stand up from sitting or when walking up uh, or, or climbing stairs. This produces an overwhelming sensation and urge to sit down and when very severe, as I mentioned to you, can lead to fainting, falls, or injuries, and of course can interfere with daily activities and can be very, very disabling. Now, from 60 to 80 percent, if not higher, of patients with MSA will develop or develop it even before other problems will develop neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. Now, this has a significant quality impact on, on quality of life, and it prevents you from doing a number of things. Now, there are already two drugs that are approved for the treatment of orthostatic hypotension, and I work on the trials for these two drugs and help getting them approved. 
One is a direct symptomimetic agent, it's called midodrin, and the other is a norepinephrine precursor called droxidopa or northera. Now, these drugs are very effective, but despite their effectiveness, there is a subset of patients that do not respond to any of the available therapies to any of these drugs. Now, on the other hand, these drugs do not preferentially increase blood pressure when standing. They increase it in, at all, in all positions. In addition, um, they require multiple daily dosing that is an added burden. So it's, it's important to, to remember that despite treatment with these drugs and other non-drug treatments, 65% of patients will remain symptomatic of patients with MSA. So they improve, but they do remain symptomatic. So, you know, in the middle of every difficulty lies an opportunity. So what is the opportunity here? Well, let me explain you this for a second. You see, this, this is a scheme of the, of the nerves, the pathways, the neurons that control the blood pressure, control the size, the caliber of the blood vessels. As you see, there are neurons in the brain, neurons in the spinal cord, and then there is the last neuron, this cable, that goes from something called the sympathetic ganglia that is to the side of your spinal cord. And then there's a cable that goes from there directly to the blood vessels and releases a transmitter, a messenger called norepinephrine. And the release of that messenger makes this blood vessel constrict and that's what maintains the blood pressure. In MSA, the release of norepinephrine is De is decreased, but although it's decreased, the neuron itself is spared. The problem is here and here, but this neuron, in, in, in um, the, the big difference with, let's say, Parkinson's disease, is that this neuron in MSA, this last neuron, is spared, meaning it's still working. So why is that important? Well, it's important because I mentioned to you that this, the, the messenger, uh, the transmitter, is released from this neuron. By using a drug called a reuptake inhibitor, we can prevent the transmitter from getting back into the neuron. Now, normally, when the transmitter is released to do what it has to do, it um, works in, in the receptor in the blood vessel and then is taken back up to be recycled in this neuron. The reuptake inhibitor prevents the neuron from taking it up and recycling it. So it maintains more norepinephrine here in what's called the neurovascular junction and it can increase the blood pressure and it can do it only at times that is necessary when uh, the patient is standing up. So there are two drugs that um, can, there are different types of uh, reuptake inhibitors that could potentially do this job. One is a short acting that we are testing now uh, called atomoxetine. And based on those results, we are now testing another uh, drug called ampreloxetine, which is also a reuptake inhibitor, but with a much longer duration of action. Now, this is a promising new medication for patients with MSA, specifically designed based on uh, the abnormality that patients with, with MSA have, so it's um, intended to work on these patients. In fact, the, there's a proportion of enrollment slots that are reserved only for patients with MSA. Now, there are enrollments at sites worldwide with expertise in MSA. There are actually 120 locations around the world where you can enroll and participate. So as I mentioned to you, one of the big advantage of this drug is that it's once a day, meaning it's long acting, and is, this is especially important for people with swallowing difficulties, uh, and of course, it increased compliance. Now, 
I want to tell you that if you have an OH, if you have uh, these symptoms, uh, you should consider getting involved. Now, I want to also tell you that the trial has been completely re-engineered in response to the pandemic, uh, the COVID pandemic, which at, in a way has been somewhat of a silver lining because it allows us to move much faster to telemedicine. So the trial has added a lot of flexibility and now you can do the visits remotely um, or in the clinic, but you can do it also at your home via telemedicine meeting with an investigator via video conference. So in addition to that, all the safety assessments will be done at home by a trained uh, visiting nurse. So again, this allows you to do the trial while at home without having to travel to the hospital. Now, I want to tell you also that um, you could participate in the track MSA and the Ampreloxetine uh, for NOH at the same time. Yes, you can participate in both because one follows your progression and Ampreloxetine is intended to um, just modify symptoms and should not change any of the endpoints of uh, track MSA. So, in summary, I want to tell you that there are a number of clinical trials that are ongoing, that there's the opportunity to participate um, either for new drugs with interventional studies, or you can be in observational studies where you are being checked and observed very carefully while you receive all the best available therapies that are already approved. Now, um, emphasize again that some clinical trials like Ampreloxetine have been adapted so that patients can be safely followed in their own home. And I want to emphasize again the importance to be optimistic, to know that there is light at the end of the tunnel, that you should consider enrolling in some of these studies, find the site near you and call the study coordinator. You see, to find a better treatment and a cure, we need you. Without you, we cannot do it. Thank you. Thank you very much.